Welcome to the Simpleton Podcast, the podcast with the most distinguished listener viewership in the world. We distinguish you. <laughs> Welcome, War Heeman. Thank you, Clark Massey. In today's podcast, we'll be talking about our sponsor. We'll be talking about making you less of a boomer. Even if you're 20-something, you still need to not be a boomer. <laughs> we'll talk about my hot take that's very uh, transgressive. We also are, are recording this on Election Day. And by the time you listen to this, uh, we hope <laughs> there's a different, <laughs> there is a president decided elect, on. President-elect, yes, yes. Yes, we hope yeah. that that is the case. With no major fiascos or election day problems, et cetera. And we then have our main topic, which we're calling Fundamentals vs. Hacks. So buckle up. Great. All right. Simpleton Podcast is brought to you by Molasses, making <laughs> healthy cereal <laughs> spicy since there was healthy cereal. Molasses predates healthy cereal, by the way. So here's the move. You can do this for yourself. You can do this for your kids. You take molasses. And if you're looking for a gateway molasses to get into the, uh, you know, hobby or whatever, you get grandma's molasses. It's usually going to be in mm -hmm. the baking session section, right? It's very sweet molasses. You dip a little spoon in it and then you hold the spoon over your healthy cereal and you start making a spiral. And then you're done. Okay. And it's going to turn the milk a little bit dark, but it's delicious. Great. You know, that sounds disgusting to me, but does Chex Mix have molasses? I feel like what che is... Chex is my favorite cereal to do this to. Okay. Well... And my kids are very happy Chex with Chex Party it. Mix was like my favorite snack before I had to stop eating it because of migraines. But it has like just unidentified stuff i think that's inside the text that makes it delicious it's worcestershire sauce i think it is i think the it's molasses Worcestershire... is too sweet yeah molasses is very yeah you got to get with yeah. this go get yourself a jar of grandma's molasses so you can rep for the show i i don't want that <laughs> 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 if it can be like a sweet sweet and salty thing that that could that could get me that it's could get kind me of a sweet and sulfuric thing <laughs> okay <laughs> Um, Laura and I both struggle with boomerisms, so I learned a new word that's already out of date. Laura's shaming me because she's so much more advanced than me on this, but one of our missionaries <laughs> introduced me to the word chugi. Yeah. And chugi means kind of real shallow stuff that was popular between like 2000 and 2010, most particularly like spiritual stuff you'd buy from Target. I mean, Chugi has a lot of definitions, but yes, but like, you mean like live, laugh, love is live, one laugh, example love, right? of Chugi. Yeah. And so the Simple House people have been trolling me forever because they know that like, my belief is Simple House is not about simple living. Like you might live simply while you're here, but that's actually not the point. Right. And so they hung this very Chugi thing where it's like fake driftwood from Target that says like <laughs> live simply on it in like black scroll. Right. And then I come to symbol house and I see it on the wall and I, I try to honor it as their house, you know, cause they actually live there. Yeah. Right. And I will take it and I would remove it and I'd like, just go put it in like the storage <laughs> closet and then it would like appear somewhere else. And they're doing it merely as a troll. Mm hmm. But you, but you didn't understand this as, at first. Well, I didn't understand that what I was rebelling against was Chugi. Yeah. I did understand that our missionaries are, I don't know what you want to call it, bad people or <laughs> <laughs> ornery, something like that. Yeah. If, if you want to learn about Chugi being Chugi, uh, please see my favorite comedian, Jenny Lorenzo. Oh, wow. Hey, you know, have you ever seen the stand-up comedy of Jen Fulweiler? She's a notable Catholic comedy. I haven't. I have not seen her stand-up comedy yet. Um, I know who she is. I read one of her books, and it was very good. Um, good. All right. In case you were wondering, Chugi is spelled C-H-E-U-G-Y. <laughs> um, in other things Laura knows about more than I do, <laughs> abattoir. Another abattoir. vocab word. <laughs> 
<laughs> for the younger generation. A B A T T O I R. Laura, please define abattoir. Abattoir. It, uh, uh, <laughs> slaughterhouse. It's a slaughterhouse. It's where you fell an animal, you cause an animal to fall. You kill it. Do they call it felling an animal or falling an animal? No, I do, it's it comes from the the French word to make something fall. Wow. To fell something. So this is more educational I than I even realized. Okay. Okay. All right. So if you got anything to add to this section of the podcast, the call in number is 913-390-3672. We're still looking for call in comments. You can comment, you can ask questions, you can just add a new vocabulary word to the segment. All right. <laughs> Election day, Laura, any thoughts? Have you voted yet? No. Um, I did something that my um, husband thinks is, um, what's the word? Uh, not questionable, but... Um, sus. Sus. <laughs> and that is, even though I am an able-bodied person, I, I got a, uh, I requested a mail-in ballot. But it came, it came, I got it yesterday. I don't know why it took so long to come. So if it's not received by seven o'clock tonight, it doesn't count. I, I know it has to be postmarked by today. So I got to go drop it off. I think in my so, state, no. it has to be received today. No, it said postmark. Okay. My, my little, well, I, I will double check that. But if not, I can just go into the regular polling, but I have to let them know uh, that I had requested a mailing ballot and then they have to do something. But. Yeah, anyway. I'm interested in the result today. It does seem important. Um, the betting markets have been kind of funny on this. Like, they were up to, yeah. like, 60-40 with a Trump win. And then the last couple of days, it went down to, like, 55-42 after some poll came out of Iowa that was kind of odd. Yeah, that's I, I read about that Iowa poll. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's rational or not that it went down or what. And we'll find out at the end of today. You know, I guess the, but, the woman that sort of uh, ran the poll has been pretty accurate in the past. Is yes. What, right. That was the thing. I heard um, she's the Mariano Rivera of polling. OK, <laughs> that's good. Uh, but. Um, um, oh, gosh. Yeah. Sorry. I just went to baseball. But did you watch? The Yankees meltdown in the fifth inning by John Boy that Media. That was wild. That was great. That was. Oh, that I was didn't. Wild. Oh, I gotta look up the John Boy Media. Apparently, it was the, wild. <laughs> the, do, the so the Yankees melted down in the last game of the World Series and lost a five-one run lead in one inning with a great pitcher, and every run was unearned. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a series of errors. And um, what was kind of interesting about it was the Dodgers had a scouting report on the Yankees that the Yankees are talent over baseball. So just make them play baseball and you will win. Like just put balls in play and you oh, will win, you know, okay. and, and that inning was scoring five runs. Just Sh proved they it. showed it. They said, yeah, just uh, yeah. run the bases aggressive and make them try to get you out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the mistakes were uh, my friend who like coaches his six year old, I'm sorry, eight year old son, like little league team, but did not grow up playing baseball said he just like felt so great about his coaching after that game because <laughs> last season he had kind of been embarrassed by some of the basic mistakes that you know uh they made but he was like if the yankees can make basic mistakes so can my boys <laughs> right. so back to the election for one moment i yeah i think that what we have right now is such a colossal like government that like um to me, it, it's it's like we have the Titanic and the iceberg is on the horizon and the iceberg is a funding debt inflation crisis, you know, and I think a little bit in this election, we're fighting over who's going to be holding the wheel right before that happens. You know, I don't yeah. know if that'll happen in the next presidency or a year or two after that, but it's like um, in a way, it's like, do you really want to hold the wheel? <laughs> yeah you're, are, are you saying with this analogy that it's a little bit unavoidable yeah it's at the point yes. where you can't mm -hmm. turn enough to miss it you could yeah. just do maybe less damage you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and we're, we want to do a podcast we've done two great inflation podcasts over the years of this podcast the the one i want to do is like the fed for dummies inflation for dummies the debt crisis for dummies just kind of like here's facts you make up your own opinion yeah. 
I want to say one more thing about the election and um, my friend, my same friend who who feels better about his kids baseball team. I, I was talking to him about it and he he works. He's a lawyer, but he, you know, uh, his law firm is uh, they defend religious freedom. So he he said that they have just been praying at their law firm uh, for for weeks that you know, uh, for all of them to just maintain their peace and that the election, our ultimate hope is not in this election. And it was just a nice reminder from him. And I was very encouraged by it. And the other thing he said was he, that he's, uh, trying to just watch the election, like a sporting game (laughs) and just, um, hold it at that level, um, in, in sense of like your, interior piece you know well, what's kind of funny like is that. like yeah i think the right this is something i hope we've tried to do in this podcast but we just don't have hardly any influence on this you know yeah and mm-hmm. but it does influence us you know so it's like but it's yeah, like it's almost like yeah. by paying attention to it we should be just learning how to position ourselves even more than root because it doesn't you know it's such an infinitesimal you know effect each each individual person. Well, I, I think there's a thing sometimes when you worry about something, you feel like you're doing something about it, you know, and what does worry do about tomorrow? Nothing, you know? <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And then once you've done what you can, you have to, it's, yeah. it's no longer any benefit mm-hmm. to think about it mm-hmm. basically, you know? So, yeah. All right. All right. I have a hot take. That's really sad. Okay. Don't even want to really give it. I keep (laughs) looking. I've always thought that there have to be a lot of problems of our own age that have to be like bloodletting was in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like just an insane thing people were doing, thinking they were helping. Yeah. Well, or I think um, also like it's like every time, like I'm waiting for the high carb diet to be recommended, you know, (laughs) because it's like we did high fat. Now we're doing high protein. (laughs) It'll be called the Japanese <laughs> when, diet. When do we go back to low fat, high carb, you know, but right. yes, because it's like the low fat embarrassment of the 80s and 90s, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's always like these like blind spots of your age, right, that mm-hmm. you should be able to see through, but don't. Right. And it feels like a lot of those right now are kind of like within healthcare, mm-hmm. you know, that like we're just not solving the base problems. We're just like inventing drugs and things. And I keep thinking like literally on TV, it's weird that we're allowing pharmaceutical advertising, period. Yes. Right? Yes. But we're advertising drugs where at the end they say may cause suicidal thoughts. My hot take is we should not be selling drugs that can lead to suicide because it's like saying this may lead to the most painful death anyone can imagine and for their family for a decade will cause harm. You know, do you want to use that drug? So I, 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 <laughs> I'm like pretty anti-pharma, but I, I don't know how to get around the fact, like a lot of the depression drugs, it's like, this could cure your depression or make you so depressed that you want to kill yourself. Like that. So that's pretty wild. But I, I feel like I can't totally say we need to do away with them because I, I, I know people who have been really helped by depression drugs, you know, and that I feel like for the most part, I think a lot of times we don't really want to address underlying causes. And we, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of things that you could, people could be doing that would help with depression that we, you know, doctors do not necessarily prescribe. So I, I would say that we're over prescribing the depression drugs but I, I know a lot of people that have successfully used depression drugs short term to get over the hump of a thing. And I also know people that that were kind of doing all the right things. And it seems like the depression drugs got them out of like a imbalance and it's been well, good for them. So I don't know. And yeah, but here's kind of it's but the crapshoot is, is it worth doing? the? And what I mean by that is I, like, I think that's a good question. And we don't take the side effects seriously enough. And it's kind of like this. It's like um, I've been talking like you and I had this bad text exchange a week or so ago. And I said, 
remember. U.S. bombed <laughs> Yemen in the last 24 hours. No one seems to care. Yemen. <laughs> Yemen. <laughs> and then you say, <laughs> you text back, this is bad that I don't know this, but haven't we been bombing Yemen? <laughs> And I'm like, I don't know, you know, and it's like that capsulates the problem is that we yeah. have empowered bureaucrats to kill people with like zero oversight, zero care, yeah. zero defense. Right. And then when I tell people about this, they kind of go, you know, I could imagine a dude like we're all at peace at some level with collateral damage. Maybe we shouldn't mm -hmm. be, but we are. It's not in just mm -hmm. war theory, but whatever. Right. I, I, I tell people we did this and this is crazy. And they're like, well, I could imagine there's a bad guy in Yemen that needed to die. I'm like, yeah, we can all imagine that. But can you imagine a process where someone in the State Department just has to agree with someone in the DOD to drop bombs yeah. and kill people in foreign countries with no process, you know, no due yeah. process, no accountability, no nothing. That's insane, right? And I think that like this idea that we're like not trying to reinvent our society away from depression, reinvent our lives, reinvent the structures of everything away from depression. But we're OK with these drugs that cause suicide. That's where the insanity is. Right. Well, I, yeah. Right. And I, I think that the incentive we I think there's like a huge incentive problem with the pharmaceutical company. And also, like you pointed out, like letting pharmaceutical companies advertise is wild. But um. Like there's just like we're we're letting this strange incentive like it. I think pharmaceutical companies drive treatment, yeah. you know, and and it is not in the interest of the pharmaceutical company to cure depression. Right. Well, the other thing that's even more dark is that every corporation, almost by law, is like a sociopath. Like they are to profit maximize. Period. They're not yeah. really concerned with everything else. Right. And in addition to them being a sociopath, they're a sociopath that's a limited liability sociopath. So meaning that they get all the benefit, but not the cost mm -hmm. of the damage they cause, right? Yeah. And it's like, that is a very fundamental premise right now of in our economy has been for hundreds of years, but we need to rethink whether or not, like if you own a pharma company and you are causing more damage, that you should not only owe your profits, but you might need to owe your personal assets if you're doing that, you know, because we've overreached on all that. Well, I mean, some 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 classes of drugs have no liability. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's super yeah. limited liability or, or yeah. no, no liability. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Instead of forming an LLC, I want to put all my yeah. assets in a no C. <laughs> uh, no, sorry. A no, a no NLC, no <laughs> liability company. <laughs> um. All right. Uh, oh, yeah. No, the Parkinson's meds are kind of crazy because some people listening to this podcast will get Parkinson's, right? Uh, we mm -hmm. just have enough listeners that one person will probably at least. So my dad had Parkinson's um, for a very long time. And the Parkinson's med side effects are weird sexual deviance and gambling. So they've had people who ruin their marriages, ruin their family's wealth due to Parkinson's meds, right? And the thing is, though, it's like, so, so then you're going to be faced with a dilemma of, would you rather just have the illness or would you rather have the med and possibly even the worst thing than the illness? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, um, but then once you start taking the med, it's a drug addiction cycle because the med is essentially speed. So you build up like a dependency on needing mm. it to feel better, you know? And it's yeah. like, if we got more okay with suffering, it would be interesting, you know? Yeah. I, I think there's, I'm, I'm trying to fish around in my mind for what it is. I, I think it's like, we think that no one should suffer. It's unfair to ask people to suffer. It's unfair that anybody should suffer. Fairness um, is a weird concept yeah. that's kind of bankrupt. Well, but then it's interesting also because this is not Parkinson's, but it's a lot of um, different illnesses can become kind of part of your identity. And so then you are demanding a type of fairness based on your whatever your illness may be and how willing are you to give up that illness and the fairness that comes <laughs> with it, you know, at some point. But. Not following um, your argument. Uh, I guess like, um, 
Well, I, I've seen people with different mental illnesses or um, like ADHD or whatever kind of make it as like a personality thing, you know, and then it's like, um, I need certain types of like, you know, accommodations, like both, you know, in school, but also social, like I need you to take this in account about me, you know, and I, I, I feel like it's like, because I am this type of person, I now make all these demands of you. <laughs> um, is that too convoluted what I'm saying? Um, I, I followed everything you just said. I don't get a link. Like we reject suffering, but we don't also, but we want to take on some of our diseases as like identities and like essential about us. And it's like a funny thing. There is no, I don't know. I'm just observing human nature, I guess. But <laughs> if that's too <laughs> convoluted, take it out, Ben. Um, Do you have anything lighthearted to transition us, Laura, before we get into fundamentals and hacks? There is a cheap and delicious recipe in the New York Times for Chinese tomato egg. It's unexpected and delightful. You don't want to give us any more hints about what a tomato egg is? <laughs> it's not a tomato egg. It's tomato eggs. Um, no, it's like a, my friend who lived in China for a while made this for me, and I was shocked by how bursting in flavor it was. But it's like uh, you cook up like... Uh, green onions and uh ginger and tomatoes together and you put ketchup in this mixture and soy sauce in this mixture you take that out of the pan you lightly scramble some eggs but not all the way then you put the other stuff back in the pan and then you mix the eggs in and it's delicious well good that was a good yeah. side conversation before we get into the main topic <laughs> <laughs> all right so this issue kind of came to my attention because I know a, I know a monk who gives very good kind of introduction to the spiritual life talks, and his talks are primarily about Lectio Divina, going on silent retreat, and things like this, right? And I think that's a good, important thing people need to hear, should be promoted. Some people went to the talk, and when I talked to them afterwards, they talked about how, you know, the talk was good, solid talk, great talk. But then mm -hmm. when they got to the Q&A, they go, the Q&A was excellent because mm -hmm. we asked him about desolation and this and this and this. And I realized that he was like answering these questions about kind of particular spiritual problems that anyone in the audience could have, but not all of them have, you know, and some of them might even have opposite problems than the thing asked. And everyone loved that, but didn't love the fundamentals. You know, right. they loved kind of this like second order problem, not the first order problem. Yeah. Right. And a similar thing I heard, um, Monsignor Pope's kind of a famous priest of the Washington Diocese, and he does spiritual direction. And I heard from one of his directees that when you go to spiritual direction, the first thing is he's like, he doesn't even want to hear what your issues are. He doesn't even want to know what you're going through. <laughs> you don't even need to talk, really. He goes, he goes, that'll be the second session. The first section is I'm just going to tell you the basics of what you need to do to have a spiritual life to make this like a, a worthwhile spiritual direction relationship, you know? And... I've been thinking about that, that like you can imagine like people having like they're like, here's a very easy distinction that I see a lot. There are people who are tempted towards being prudes. There are tempted people who are tempted towards being libertine, you know, and way too lax with their morality. Right. They almost need exactly the opposite spiritual direction. Mm hmm. You know, it would be disastrous to give them the same spiritual direction. And there are kind Both of ways. like. Yeah. And there's kind of hacks and tips and tricks in each one, yeah. you know, and when you have a open conversation, everyone loves to work on a problem that's not theirs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My sister had this idea that we should clean each other's houses because oh, it's yeah. less annoying to clean someone else's mess than your own. Well, you see it, you see it more and 100 percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'll go. Yeah. I'll set. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, I, I think. Um, when you brought this up, I had, um, you know, what it what it reminded me of um, was one of my favorite podcasters, uh, former Olympic volleyball player, Gabby Reese, uh, has, you know, at least a couple hundred podcast episodes. But a thing that she says is like that she's just restating the same things over and over and over. You know, <laughs> it's like eat well, you know, get off the sugar train. Um, get good sleep, do some exercise, have good relationships, 
spend some quiet time in reflection and in nature. You know, like it's like all of her advice is really just these like same fundamental things. And after you and I kind of through these talked about that briefly, she she actually released an episode where it was like, uh, you know, like the foundations versus the hacks, you know, and it's like you just like you have to have these big things in place and then the sort of hacks can maybe be fine tuning, you know, to optimize your sleep or um, or, you know, you've you have really tried eating healthy now for some time and you've really made the effort and you can see that there might be a hormonal problem now, you know, <laughs> um, you didn't jump to the, she, she's not saying this. I'm, I'm kind of now saying my like own you thing, kind but of discover like, the second order problem only after you've handled all the yes, first order and problems. She, um, one of her points in this hacks versus, uh, you know, fundamentals episode is that you want to do all the hack easy things and they become a distraction from like, the real <laughs> things of like wellness, you know, that that's so true with me because like, I will not want to do the things I just know I should do. And then I'll hear mm -hmm. a podcast where they'll talk about the goodness of bacon and like a bacon diet. And I'll be like, yes, yes. <laughs> the bacon diet will make me healthy. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And yeah. it's not that there isn't some grain of truth in there. It's just like, I, I'm not going to be healthy from the bacon diet because I didn't do anything else to be healthy. <laughs> right. I and mean, she's, she, she would say like, like she takes supplements, but she's like, who cares about optimizing your supplements? <laughs> you know, if you're not eating, you know, basically well and trying to get some sleep, you know? And I think like in the spiritual life, there are just like some, some basics that, that we know, like, we ought to be doing, you know, and it's like, are you allowing for some quiet time in your life to encounter God, you know, <laughs> before you jump? So the basics are probably charitable work, mm -hmm. um, silent prayer, sacraments, scripture, electio divina, things like this, mm -hmm. right? And the other parallel I have with health is I was talking to someone who'd gone through a formation program where the, the most popular talk in the formation program each year was, um, it was like a missionary formation program, was they would talk about all these different spiritual problems you could have and kind of the way out of each one, right? And this person said, and then you spend the year wondering which of these spiritual problems you're in and self-diagnosing, and you're actually not doing the fundamentals, you're kind of being the, a spiritual hypochondriac, Right. And I found this to be kind of true that people mm -hmm. would rather like if you, if like with, with like the prude and the uh, libertine, um, you don't want to tell them all the other problems of the, each other, even though it might all be true knowledge, just cause it's just, it becomes an unhelpful distraction in the spiritual, life, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. One, one is like, it's, it's an, un, can be an unhelpful distraction. It's like, am I this, am I, is what is actually happening this? Um, I think like another interesting thing is when people are giving kind of spiritual advice, like it's great when it comes from a place of experience, you know, and it could be like, you know, I, <laughs> I had the experience of desolation and here's what I did to get out of it. Or I had a friend that was struggling with this, I think could also be kind of, um, I don't love as like, <laughs> if this, then that, if this, then that, you know, like, oh, you're struggling with this. Here's the remedy. I don't know if it works, but, <laughs> um, right. This is, and, and this is a change in the church. Like you could actually go back, um, almost a hundred years ago and find, uh, theological textbooks of spiritual theology. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't write those textbooks anymore because making spirituality a recipe like thing just is not that constructive for the seminarians and the future yeah. priests. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I kind of meant to say the corollary with health there is like, if you have like a stomach problem and you like go online and read all the different possible things a stomach problem can be, Mm -hmm. And maybe you just ate too much Mexican food, but now you're worried about cancer <laughs> and, and ulcer, you know, and it's like actually just stop eating Mexican food for a while and see what happens, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that happens in the spiritual life, right? But yeah. 
Go ahead. I, I think there's, I think just to, well, to tie it back to like, um, antidepressants <laughs> and, and medicine, it's like, I, I think there's just like different temptations. Um, and I, I don't want to apply this to everyone that's on an antidepressant, but sometimes people go on different medications because they want the problem to be solved outside of themselves. You know, it's like, I, I am not going to do the hard work of, you know, making my body better for whatever condition I have. Like, I just want the medication, you know, like we know this, this is a problem. And I also think that there's an issue that I see also in the health world, which is a good parallel is that people, um, want to understand like why, they are the exception, you know, um, cause it, it gets you off the hook a little bit. Like, uh, um, and I, it's like, I could mine all of Gabby Reese's podcasts <laughs> to explain like why I gained, you know, uh, 20 pounds in the last two years or whatever, but you know, did I, did I try to rein in my eating and exercise or whatever, before I looked for this special reason of, uh, a hormone imbalance or a thing or cortisol or et cetera, et cetera. And I, I think there's like a lot of times there's a temptation to find like the exception and we need to kind of exhaust all the normal possibilities first. <laughs> um, so in the spiritual life, and this might also be in the general health, but like the whole idea of the manual was that you're lying to yourself. You're in denial of basic aspects of reality and that you need to somehow start your spiritual life to kind of get out of that situation. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's the same thing as saying the big human problem is rationalizing. Yeah. And if you don't do the first steps, you can't get to the point where you realize the tricks you've played on yourself. Yeah. Um, there's, I, uh, found some old quotes from father Adam and, and one, one of the ideas he said was that we spend a lot of time creating stress so that we don't have to be alone with ourselves, you know, um, or alone with God. And I think that's the rationalizing, you know, um, and the looking for reasons and trying to get ourselves off the hook, you know, uh, so we don't have to face ourselves. Um, the other great thing that Father Adam used to talk about, and I think you've said your parents kind of had a little bit of a list like this, is that his mom would say that there are four things that matter. Um, dawn, bread, work, and rest. Um, and those are just basic. <laughs> kind of the basic ingredients of living a healthy life. Yeah, yeah. Right, and if you don't do that, then yeah. complaining about your problems doesn't make sense yeah. yet. You I know. think you had a... Yeah, mine was, did you eat enough, pray enough, get enough exercise? Like you you would call home from college and be like, yeah. I'm in a funk, right? And they would yeah. be like... Here's what, a checklist. Did you eat? <laughs> Sleep, uh -huh. exercise, and, and then, pray. then finally... Pray was I, the last one, right? <laughs> well, prayer yeah. was the funny one because like I never got to the prayer one. I always... If they said, did you eat, sleep, exercise... I would always fail before I got through all three. And then I got to a point in life where I got through all three and I was still in a funk because I was having this religious conversion moment. Yeah. And I go and they go, well, did you pray about it? Did you pray enough? And I'm like, what does <laughs> it praying enough mean? Yeah. You know, and then I realized yeah. I'd, yeah, that, that line of questioning was no longer my problem. So I think there's an interesting conversation I want to have with you not in this podcast, but at some point, it's this idea of like, we tend to think that philosophy and ideas drive us and drive our society. But with this idea of rationalizing being an enormous human problem, you have to start wondering if society actually drives philosophy. Meaning like, um, well, I'm going to give the most obvious example in my mind would be postmodernism, right? Did postmodern philosophers, in a sense, because they had these ideas that made society postmodern or was society going to become postmodern? And then we created an enormous philosophy around it and you go, Oh yeah, but I can find this postmodern philosopher before society was mm -hmm. postmodern. It's like, well, in economics, we say this guy has successfully predicted um, six of the last three recessions. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, like someone right. before the event <laughs> will have gone down the road and then they yeah. become like the saint of that philo philosophical school, you know? Well, but, I, I think there's like a funny thing in fashion where, where, you know, the fashion industry will be like, 
we've checked the wind chimes right. and have looked around right. and Brown is back, right. you know? Yeah. But them designing Brown brings Brown back. So it, it's like, what, what is, wh which way is yes. it? <laughs> All right, a symbiosis or yeah, whatever, yeah. maybe positive or negative feedback. Yeah. Word. But like, I kind of think though that like ancient philosophy, which is not in style in most universities, um, doesn't have this problem so much. Um, it's more kind of the post, you know, I mean, I don't think mm -hmm. Thomas Aquinas has the problem of uh, society creating Thomas Aquinas or vice versa. I think he's just doing good philosophical work. But I think a lot of what we think of as like Weltanschauung, like worldviews, communism, et cetera, mm -hmm. as like these like philosophical movements and mm -hmm. political philosophy and stuff, maybe all rationalization or mostly. It's like, I want to invade Mexico. Get me a philosophy where we're going to invade Mexico. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right, right. And it won't even be like overt. It'll just be like, I kind of want to invade Mexico. And then on my free time, I'm just thinking up all the reasons, you know? Yeah, yeah. I guess it's like, like I like, well, Marx, like did Marx, was Marx a disruption or was Marx filling in kind of the natural <laughs> next right. step? Like, you know, like, well, sometimes say that a lot of the like, um, not just class conflict that we talk about, but there's also sex conflict and other oppression dialogues, right? And we kind of blame Marx for this, right? Could be that Marx has nothing to do with this at all, but Marx is what those people want to use to justify it. You know, he's just like a you useful- You like codified um, something that was coming. Yeah he, yeah, he articulated it and they're, they're happy to use his articulation. Yeah. But if Marx had never existed, we'd still have this problem and somebody else would just write it because yeah. it's so obvious, you know? I, yeah. With postmodernism, I tend to think that that end of the age of like, the communist revolutions, the Nazi uh, cause of World War II, the Japanese, like incredible imperial Japan, like idea they were going to take over and just rule Asia, you know, that the end of that conflict, the end of World War II with the atomic bomb kind of made everyone skeptical of anyone who thought they knew everything. Yeah. You know, and Catholics kind of can be on both sides of this because Catholics should not have pretended that we had an ideology that competed. We have something beyond an ideology, but there were Catholics who treat our religion as if it were an ideology. Mm -hmm. But like, I kind of think that atomic bomb being the end result of humans who thought they knew everything made humans not believe they knew everything and be very yeah. suspicious of anyone who thought they did. And that sounds very, that sounds like that's just postmodernism, yeah. you know, um, in a way, history caused postmodernism, not the thinkers, not the Frankfurt school of the interwar period. Anyway. We need to, this dessert, I almost wish we had someone else. I don't know how to even yeah. have a good discussion. Who would this. be the right person? <laughs> well, if you're the right person, call in. Our yeah. call in line is 913-390-3672. We want you to come explain to us if philosophy drives society or society drives philosophy. You've got 30 seconds in a voicemail to make your <laughs> point. <laughs> <laughs> We're um, also open to emails. Yes. I think it's asimplehouse yeah. at gmail.com. Great. Laura, Good. thank you for another episode of the Simpleton Podcast. We'll see you at the other side where we hope there is a president elect. It's a very low bar for a successful election. Well, I, I mean, I mean we've, is, had, we've, we've had, had plenty of elections that were, you know, took a second to understand what was going on, hanging chads and all that, you know. Oh my um, gosh, it's just like inexcusable we even have these problems. Like, if you can't fix the, yeah. that, like, what else are you going to be able to fix? But here you know? we are. So. <laughs> I know, here we are. We don't want to yeah. fix it. So, all right. Um, God bless all you, right, Great. All right. Talk to you later, Clark. Talk to you later. Bye. Goodbye.